O yüzden dilerseniz sunuma geçiyorum fazla vakit kaybetmemek adına. Uh, dear guests, we uh, at the uh, at this session we will listen to uh, David Martin Jones. He's our fourth uh, sure. He's our fourth uh, keynote speaker, and he will uh, make a speech entitled "Lost Histories: Cinema's Ethical Encounters with the Past in World Cinemas." But before that, uh, allow me to introduce him. David Martin Jones is a professor of film studies in the University of Glasgow. His research exists at the intersection of cinema and philosophy and explores how national and transnational identities are constructed in and across various cinemas of the world. He is the author editor of nine books, included, including a great book with the title Cinema Against Double Thing and over 50 articles and chapters. His work has been translated into Chinese, Korean, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Turkish, Persian, and Estonian. He co-edits the award-winning Bloomsbury series, Thinking Cinema. He co-founded and co-edits DeleuzeCinema.com and serves on uh, several editorial boards and advisory boards. Without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Martin Jones. Thank you. Thank you. I trust everyone can hear me. So my thanks to Serda Ozturk uh, and Cine Philosophy in general for this very kind invitation to participate in this symposium on film and philosophy. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Thanks also to Erdic uh, for helping with the session and this very uh, warm introduction. Here I am in Scotland. The temperature this morning in this Saturday morning is minus six degrees. So should there be some problem with the Zoom? And you might think to yourself, ah, the Zoom has frozen. He's very still. You have to decide, is it the Zoom that's frozen still? Or is it in fact me that has frozen still? Okay, that's my one and only joke. Don't worry, there won't be any more. I shall share screen. Here we go. Just trying to get it up to full screen. I think the computer is frozen. There we go. All right, here we go. So today I'm going to discuss some of the complexities which surround ethical encounters with otherness, human and non-human that are offered by a world of cinemas. And before we go any further, just to clarify what I mean by this term, a world of cinemas, I do not mean there is Hollywood and then there is world cinema, not this very old fashioned binary but more a positive definition of this term world cinema, or I use the term a world of cinemas, in line with Lucien Ajib's important intervention from 2006. Um, so that's what I mean by world cinema. I focus in particular on encounters with the past and the challenge of understanding world history, or perhaps we should say the histories of the world. So I'm going to begin by outlining an argument that I made in the still fairly recent book, Cinema Against Double Think from 2018. This book explores how various films from around the world engage with, engage with transnational histories. And by this term, transnational histories, what I'm trying to get at is that in some cinemas, we can see histories deeper than or geographically broader than any one nation Bearing in mind, I think everyone knows the nation is a very new concept, but yet in film studies, we tend to look for nation quite a lot. So I was trying to look for the transnational histories that aren't the histories of the nation. These films explore transnational histories, I argue, by constructing ethical encounters with the lost pasts of world history. And I make this case drawing on the ideas of Gilles Deleuze, who would be very well known to many people, I'm sure, but also the Argentine philosopher Enrique Dussel. And I'm not sure if he has the same coverage in different parts of the world, certainly very uh, well known in the Hispanic speaking world, but not necessarily in other places. I guess it depends. The past which these films offer us encounters with are past which have disappeared or been forcefully removed from the world's memory. Indigenous pasts, for example, or the past of lost species, or of political opposition movements, and so on. So I'm not going to dwell on this argument in depth today. I'll introduce it, and then I'll move on. And I'm going to indicate the key challenge, which has been voiced to this idea since its publication, which I think is very interesting. And then finally, I shall reflect upon and develop 
upon my original idea by exploring something of a limit case to the idea. The, 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 the film which I watched where I thought, actually, everything I've been arguing doesn't quite work here. And, and what do we say with this film? So it's something that's coming next. And this is a Chinese documentary called Though I Am Gone, or sometimes known as Though I Am Dead, by Hu Jie from 2006. And this has been written about quite a lot. So I'm not going to tell you anything you don't perhaps already know about this film. But I think it's a good example for getting at the, the question that's been raised about my work by the interventions since then. So this is a film about the legacy of China's cultural revolution. And the discussion of this film should be the majority of the paper. And this is a chapter which I have forthcoming in a new book. Um, you've had a keynote from, from Robert Sinnerbrink already. So it's a book that Robert and I and Lucy Bolton have edited called Contemporary Screen Ethics. And throughout this paper, there's going to be an attempt to think about critique and develop upon Gilles Deleuze's idea of cinema and his cinematic ethics. And for anyone who's encountered any of my work, you'll probably see it. And that's partly been my approach this whole time um, to sort of take Deleuze and critique it and try and use it and get the cinema to question Deleuze, if you like. And uh, some people think that this is a bit rude or a bit arrogant, but I actually think it's quite Deleuze. And I think he always said, what I like to do is I like to take the work of a philosopher and try and challenge it and think anew with it. And I think I've been trying to do the same with Deleuze. So just for clarity, I have a great respect for Deleuze's work. It's phenomenal. I could never have written what he did. Um, but still, nevertheless, I think to be Deleuzean is to challenge it and work with it. Now, Deleuze's cinematic ethics emerges in Cinema 2, 1985, between the sections on the time images, labyrinthine temporal powers of the false, which are effectively a way of talking about history, and modern political or minor cinema. And his cinematic ethics includes the role that the past may play in the present for political reasons. And this will be important as informing backdrop to, the, to, to, the, to today's discussion. So today, the question of ethics and what cinema may help us to believe in about this world will be to the fore. And the two key questions which arise from continued analysis of the problem, two key questions which keep informing my thinking are as follows. Is it precisely this world, as Deleuze suggests, or is it rather this world's history that cinema asks us to believe in? And as I'm trying to point out, his cinematic ethics appears in between these moments where he's talking about history and modern political cinema. So I think he's actually saying not only this world, but this world's history. And secondly, to what extent can we argue that cinema can foster a belief in this world and indeed world history when there is so much that we cannot know and we're often made aware of our inability to know through watching films um, in the encounter with a world of cinemas. So today's paper then provides a working through of these questions. To begin with, and quite briefly, I think the argument from cinema against doublethink, um, if anyone has read it, forgive me, but I'll, I won't do too much of this. Across the world of cinemas, we see films engaging in similar ways aesthetically with transnational histories from within world history. So just to reiterate, transnational history, history is broader geographically or deeper history, historically than histories of the nation. And what is apparent is the use of the time image to provide a shorthand version of these histories recurring across cinemas worldwide. So films from very different parts of the world can be seen to be doing similar things if you look at them in a certain way. And... Such cinematic encounters with the past, specifically with lost pasts, disappeared past, censored past, forgotten past, eradicated past, are structured aesthetically like ethical encounters with others in a manner akin to a Levinasian or a post-Levinasian ethics. And I'll, I'll say more about that momentarily, but this is where the Enrique Dussel comes in. So, for example, we can consider how the any space whatever, one of Deleuze's concepts, or the crystal of time, another of his concepts, or even the affection image, can confront us with the lost paths of extinct species or exterminated ind indigenous people and so on. And here are some examples which people are perhaps familiar with, encounters with lost paths in affection images. So one might say that with the time image or with an analytical filter or lens uh, that, that is the time image, as it were, using the time image as an analytical filter or lens, the transnational histories of, of world cinema can appear. One could say it in that way. Or one might argue that, that what Deleuze theorized in the time image, and he does discuss world memory after all, was not as well realized in European cinemas, which he focuses on mainly, as it can now be in the cinemas of the world. So one way is to say, well, it's quite a Deleuzean reading of a world of cinemas. And another way to say it is, well, actually, a world of cinemas shows us more clearly what, what Deleuze was perhaps aiming at. 
I'm not quite sure which one of those. It's probably somewhere in between. There's a lot more to this argument in the book than this. For instance, the book makes use of contract theory as well to explore the kinds of encounters we're experiencing. For example, how we understand encounters with the history of the planet. How can you talk about, you know, a, a, this sort of geological history as something you encounter in cinema? It sounds a bit bizarre, but if you think about Michel Serre and the natural contract, it starts to come into, into view a little bit that um, cinemas of the world, they kind of use monsters or extinct species or mythical beasts to sort of make a face for us through which uh, the earth can speak. And this is just one example of the various contracts that is explored in the book, the natural, the racial, the social, and so on. The exploration of the ethics of such encounters is also informed by the thinking of Enrique Dussel. Now, Dussel is an Argentine philosopher, as I say, but he's been based in Mexico since the 1970s. He had to flee the dictatorship. And he's a key figure in the philosophy of liberation. He's written hundreds of books, so perhaps people have heard of him. He provides a post levinasian ethics, um, which I think is helpful. In, in film philosophy, we've, we've, there's been a lot of work on Levinas and ethics and how we can understand cinema in that way. And I think it's wonderful work. But I think that we get something a bit different with the Dussel, and it unlocks something about world cinemas for us. Whilst um, the other for Levinas is a biblical other, or perhaps it's an archetypal other, if you like. It's the stranger, the widow, the child. But the other for Dussel is a historicized other, and it's all those excluded from modernity worldwide. So the key finding of this book is that a world of cinemas constructs encounters with lost past to shake the viewer out of their complacency regarding their established understanding of history. And in particular, and I'm really talking for someone like myself, I suppose you would call me a, I don't know, a white middle-aged man from, from the global north. It shakes me out of a Eurocentric model of world history, makes me realize that that is not actually the central history of the world. So this is why it's Dusselian. So while Levinas believes the encounter with the other can shake us out of our egocentric sense of self, Levinas, the Dusselian encounter with lost pasts in a world of cinema shakes us out of our hegemonic sense of world history because the other for Dussel is all those excluded by modernity worldwide. All right, so the potential of this ethics then is the ability to make us hesitate with regard to what we think we know when we encounter what we do know. Well, sorry, when we encounter what we do not know on screen. So it's, it's the ability to make us hesitate with regard to what we think we know when we encounter what we do not know on screen. And hence, I've called this cinema against doublethink because Orwellian doublethink, you will remember, suggests that you can and should forget any history which challenges the hegemonic view of history. So it closes down history to a sort of singular dominant perspective. But the encounter with the world of cinemas, conversely, and I've put a slide up from Embrace of the Serpent, which is a wonderful film in this respect, I think, attempts to open up this gap once more to make us hesitate in our belief in what is the, the sort of the central line of history, make us realize that there are a lot of histories. As what we encounter in these transnational histories are lost pasts, we are often also reminded by their cinematic representation that we cannot know them. They are by definition lost pasts. So there's something very paradoxical here and it, it causes me a lot of mental gymnastics. We are reminded that these pasts existed, but also that they are now gone. And in this sense, they are completely unknowable. So this hesitant, hesitant ethics created by the encounter with the world of cinemas gives us a pause to reconsider what we held to be true about the past, but also creates great uncertainty over what may have been the case historically due to our inability to know the past which are lost. And this is what sets this idea at odds or just different from some existing ideas. So if you take Alison Landsberg's wonderful idea of prosthetic memory, it's brilliant, but it doesn't really work if you look at a film like Embrace of the Serpent, where it's an indigenous past, that you cannot really know. And the film is kind of telling you, you can't really understand this because it's this different cosmology, which you're getting a glimpse of, but you're not. it's not explained to you. You just kind of have to somehow gleam something of it. And this is not a prosthetic memory that you can attach to yourself and go, now I have that prosthetic memory. I am at one with the indigenous. You know, it's just, it doesn't do that. So the idea of prosthetic memory and this idea of the encounter with the lost past, they're quite different, I think. The idea of the lost past and the encounter with it, the ethical encounter and hesitation, it's more like Miriam Hirsch's idea of post-memory. Um, post-memory is this idea that, um, for example, children whose parents were murdered or 
disappeared as it were during the cold war under dictatorships in different parts of the world these children are trying to find that past and they use post-memory work to recreate it maybe using toys and other things that evoke childhood so this idea of the lost past is a little bit more like Miriam Hirsch than it is like Alison Landsberg but still it's different from Miriam Hirsch because Miriam Hirsch has a um, autobiographical link very clear there between the children of the disappeared and the memory that they're trying to, to trying to find but here we don't have that because it's a transnational history it's not of our own culture necessarily and yet we are encountering it okay so to conclude on cinema against double think and move on this is a work of film philosophy which attempts to join other research looking to decolonize and de-westernize knowledge especially by exploring a world of cinemas now i really enjoyed watching patricia pister's keynote yesterday i managed to um, get a paper in in between various meetings and and so on and and i noticed that also there was that similar attempt to decolonize which i think is really important for film philosophy nowadays okay so the most sustained engagement with the book thus far has come from Rob Stone and Louis Friejo, and their point of contention with my argument is that, okay, they say, like, all right, David, we get your idea, but it is not enough, they say. This is not enough for our relationship with world cinema, whether for understanding our relationship with world cinema or for the positivity that they feel is there in our encounter with a world of cinemas. And they're they think that there is a more positive power to world cinemas and that this relies on our ability to know or perhaps to learn rather than to realise what we cannot know through the encounter with otherness. So they're seeing my take on it as a bit negative. And they shift the emphasis from the unknowable, such as the lost past, which I focus on, to the as yet unknown. And I find this argument very compelling. And I don't intend to sort of oppose it here, but I'm going to try and work with it and the gap between my idea and their idea. Now, they move in a different direction anyway to counter my arguments about hesitation. They use a Derridean deferral of meaning. They focus on empathy and they emphasize genre film. So it's quite different in any case. But actually, for me, the distinction that between our positions is not that vivid. I think quite a lot resonates and we, we remain in similar terrain. For example, Friejo and Stone use the, the scene depicted here from the Western Wind River from 2017, which I, I guess perhaps a lot of people have seen, to illustrate their point. Here, an indigenous American, Martin, played by Gil Birmingham, of in the film is of Eastern Shoshone descent, has put on a death mask, this white and blue face, to mourn his deceased daughter. As there is nobody left alive from his tribe to tell him how to make this mask, however, he has simply made it up and he sort of says as much. And as Stone and Friejo note, this is precisely the, the lost past, which I've been examining. As a lost past, it is unknown. And I think that this is what the film may be reminding us of. But from their perspective, we should understand this lost past as the signified. And as such, its meaning is perpetually deferred into the future. So it's not unknowable so much as it is as yet unknown. Okay, so that these are this is the difference between their thinking and, and my thinking. So to me, despite this critique, our positions are not dissimilar. And I think this is because of the Deleuzean ground upon which I build my analysis. And I think this because I think there's a lot of resonances between a book like Cinema 2 by Deleuze and Spectres of Marx by Jacques Derrida. Not only is there that very foregrounded play with Hamlet and time being out of joint in both of them, but if you take, say, The People Yet to Come, of Deleuze's modern political or minor cinema. It's not that dissimilar to Derrida's New International. Um, and both of these indeed seem to be deferred into the future. But I would, I would try and sort of make a fine point about my argument about hesitation. My suggestion of hesitation does not, I do not think, necessarily preclude there being a future potential in the encounter with, with the unknown. I think it makes you hesitate, but I don't think that's necessarily the end point. I think the hesitation is then productive. It leads you to think again. So I think there is something that we share, I think, in our uh, respective positions. But I would emphasize, and this is different, that to me, the ethical experience of the realization of a lost past uh, in a way which focuses us on that realization, uh, that moment is, I think, key to what I'm trying to argue. I would focus analytical attention here more so than I would on a future which may arise from it necessarily. And the reason why that's important to me is because I was trying to argue against it, another form of hesitation. This is why I called it cinema against double think, which has been around for uh, the last decade. It's really amplified with fake news. And 
you know, let's say Bruno Latour, for example, sort of famously said that the right wing was using cognitive dissonance to deny climate change. It said, well, well, we'll bring forward a different idea and we'll make people very confused as to what is the case. So the scientists say there's climate change and we should do something. But then we put forward some other ideas. That is, there isn't really. So people go, oh, a bit of a head scratcher. I, I'm not really sure. So hesitation there is very stultifying. It's very negative. It stops you from acting. But I'm trying to reclaim this idea of hesitation as something that that makes you sort of um, opens a window for you to realize that things that you thought were true are not necessarily true, um, which is still, I think, positive politically. So I guess there's a lot hangs on, you know, how compelling my argument is as to where you stand politically. Stone and Friejo, for their part, are trying to point us towards a future for world cinema study, one in which we can proceed with empathy to try to understand more about alterity through the cinematic encounter with it. And that's really laudable, and I'm on board with that, so I'll, I'll go along with that. But what I want to suggest today is that the myriad nature of world cinema and the complexities surrounding the encounter with world histories which it creates make it very difficult to proceed in this way. This is due to what the viewer does not know <clears throat> does not know when they're viewing certain films, does not know when they're viewing certain films, yeah. So with this idea in mind, for the remainder of the paper, I wish to turn to the example of the Chinese film that I flagged up before, Though I Am Gone, sometimes also known as Though I Am Dead. This film is banned in China, but you can find it on the internet. <clears throat> the question... <clears throat> Sorry. The question this film asks us to consider further is that which Stone and Friejo's engagement with cinema against double think highlights. In world cinema, to what extent is the lost past unknowable or as yet unknown? Indeed, how should we understand this relation to a cinematic ethics like the one I am proposing after Deleuze and Dussel? So as I say, this is like a limit case. This is the, the film I watched where I thought of all the films I've watched and what I tried to make an argument for, this one is a bit different. Okay. So this film come is it's like a certain kind of films that's, that's been emerging in the 2000s and 2010s. Documentaries about lost histories of eradicated political oppositions from the Cold War. So these kinds of films, I'm sure people have seen some of these. Um, they tend to deal with the eradication of political opposition movements during a state of siege or state of exception, and the search for these lost pasts by generations that come later, or the attempt to preserve these lost pasts, we might say. If we consider their examination of history, what we often find in such films is this idea. The personal museum of memory upholds cultural memory more broadly for the public sphere. That is, the private archive standing in for what was disappeared about the past officially from the official record of the past during the state of exceptional state of siege, what was eradicated, remains in private archives. This is the notion that when a state sets out to erase a political opposition within its own borders and then to also erase its own actions in this respect from history, a bulwark against this Orwellian rewriting of history remains in the memories and private archives of individuals. I'm just going to give a brief example of a very lovely film, which I suspect no one has seen because it's very hard to get. Um, it's a Uruguayan documentary by Juan, Al Juan Alvarez Neme called Al Pie del Arbol Blanco, at the foot of the white tree, and this is from 2007. And this is about the recovery of photos taken by a photographer, Aurelio Gonzalez, who you see there holding up one of his photos, who worked for the communist newspaper El Popular in Uruguay, Montevideo, which was shut down by the government in 1973. Now, Gonzalo, Gonzalez was in the building when the paper was shut down, and he kind of hid the archive of photos uh, that he'd taken, most of them, from, from the newspaper. So Gonzalez went into exile when the dictatorship came into power. He managed to escape the building and escape the soldiers. Um, but he hid the archive before he left. On his return, years later, he sought out the photos. What's interesting in the documentary is the building has completely changed. It's a commercial venue, but they do find the archive. It's quite incredible. So this is an archive of a now closed newspaper. So you could say, oh, well, that's that's not what you were saying, David. This is a lost a lost public archive. But actually, it's Gonzalez's personal search, which we learn about, his personal memory, his investment in his photographic archive, an archive which he created, he hid, and only he seems to care about anymore. And this search is undertaken so that the archive can reinform a broader cultural memory. And at the end, or really at the beginning of the documentary, but at the end of the process of searching, he donates his personal archive to the people of Uruguay. 
So as I said, such documentaries construct personal audiovisual museums of memory on screen to try to show us these lost pasts in spite of the absence of footage which actually records them. And these are some of the photos from the era which were recovered and which the film gives us access to. Noticeably, the film makes a point in the final scenes of mingling these photos with Gonzalez's personal photographs of his life to indicate how the private archive can inform public memory. And if you ever visit Uruguay's physical museum of memory, you will find several of these images on display and they're from Gonzalez's archive. So without his personal search for them, um, there will be little left to memorialize the time publicly. The, the, the museum of memory is quite abstract. It has things like a prison door hanging from the ceiling to show imprisonment. You know, there's not much left. It's been eradicated. But yet they have these photos because of this personal search for the archive. So personal memories and archives then to counter the eradication of oppositional or alternative pasts in the world's memory. Of course, not all these films do this in the same way. So Joshua Oppenheimer's The Act of Killing stands out as the exception. But in general, the tension being explored seems to be that between the ability of the Cold War state of exception to eradicate the past and the ability of the individual or individuals to uphold the memory of a different past, typically one in which some individuals felt they belonged more to collectives uh, than we perhaps do nowadays. So these are very sort of Cold War era um, explorations. And what these films show us is that there is a lost past they show us there is a lost past, but we cannot know it because it's lost. So that's that paradox that gives me that mental gymnastics. Nevertheless, by becoming aware of it, we can question what we do know about history. So that's what I think is going on there. Now, part of this trend, but standing out from it, so similar but a little bit distinct, is Hugh Jay's Though I Am Gone. And this is a remarkable work of time image cinema. If you ever get to see it, um, the composition of the editing is, is quite stunning. It has an aesthetic which appears to be almost haunted by time and it's done in very subtle ways with soundtrack and image but it's it's really captivating now this one stands out from this trend that i identified and this is useful for addressing the issues raised by stone and friejo because of the complexities it illustrates over what is unknown and what is unknowable about history in the encounter with world cinema though i am gone documents one man's preservation of a private archive of materials evidencing his wife's death during China's Cultural Revolution. So this is uh, Mr. Wang Jingyao, and he maintains his archive in the face of the way that official state history has been constructed and preserved during and afterwards. So two quick caveats here, because we could be making false assumptions. One, the extent to which we can call the Cultural Revolution a state of exception is complex. There, there are ways you could not call it a state of exception. But on balance, it seems fair to call it that due to the suspension of the rule of law at that time. Secondly, it's not the case that, you know, the Cultural Revolution has sort of been disappeared from history at all. There has been a government acknowledgement of the damage done by the Cultural Revolution. But even so, as we see with uh, Mr. Wang Jingyao, not justice for all, not for all victims or their loved ones, and still no official museum of memory. And I think that's where it's not been eradicated from history, but we're not memorialising it either. Uh, Professor Martin John, sorry for intruding, but... Uh, I guess our interpreters uh, might have problems following you. So can you please uh, speak a little bit sl slower? Uh, I'm sorry. It's my enthusiasm for the talk uh, getting you. better on me. Okay, I'll go a bit slow. Okay. Okay. So this is... Um, this is what, why well, I wouldn't say this documentary is beautiful. I would say it's sort of captivating, um, amazingly constructed, but it is very harrowing. So this is where we start to see this. So this is the Beijing school teacher, uh, Biang Zhongyong, who was married to Mr. Uh, Wang uh, Jingyao. Now she was killed by her students in August, 1966. Biang was the vice principal of the girls' middle school attached to Beijing Normal University. And she was also the party secretary. And the school students included many children of influential party members. The death of Bian is well known in China and the topic of much public debate in the ensuing decades. Hu Jie's documentary is banned in China, as I said, although it's been widely viewed on the internet. And Though I Am Gone focuses on uh, Wang Jingyao, Bian's grieving widower, and he's preserved the evidence and the memory of his wife's brutal murder in the hope that it may one day be officially brought to trial. Failing that, he notes, it might inform an official museum of memory to victims of the Cultural Revolution. So in Deleuzean terms, Wang's is an ethical mode of existence. 
it helps keep alive the possibility that the past might be seen differently to an officially recognized to its officially recognized form so it keeps alive the possibility of justice being wrought in the future by maintaining the the virtual past wang's mode of existence is choosing to choose to believe in this world and for him this is a very painful world is thus that of the personal archivist acting in the minoritarian anticipation of a people yet to come. He maintains his personal past, hoping that it can inform the public sphere anew later on. So the documentary in this sense does seem rather like the previous ones mentioned. Indeed, there is an academic consensus of scholars who write wonderfully on Chinese cinema that the film constructs exactly a personal archive. So I won't read all these out, just pick out a few key terms. Alternative archive, virtual museum of forbidden memory, uh, gesture of resistance against delib deliberate amnesia. So this is precisely, as I've argued, of documentaries from other locales, the, the, the personal museum of memory to counter the official story of history. Yet, to be very accurate, and this is a key point for this argument, Wang's mode of existence embodies less a belief in this world than in the potential of this world's history. And this is crucial because how we understand this history is so complex in this film, the way it frames that history and how much of it we may or may not understand from that. And it's helpful to think about this in a little more depth. So I'm going to evoke Elizabeth Jelin and the book State Repression and... Uh, and the Labours of Memory, State Repression and the Labours of Memory from 2003, Elizabeth Jelin, which I found to be a really key text for helping me think about this. Jelin observes that memories which survive in the private sphere with the potential to later reinform the public rarely form a single coherent counter narrative to the official story of history. Rather, various individual experiences of the past create, quote, multiple social and political viewpoints. Accordingly, what is explored in Though I Am Gone is not so much private memory against public silence, because there isn't exactly public silence anyway, but to follow Jelen, memory against memory. And with this pitting of memory against memory, what it throws into relief is the complexity surrounding what is unknowable and what is as yet unknown. Let us delve into the film then to see how. Wang preserved events using a camera that he bought the day after Bian's death. And he states that he did this because he was, quote, determined to record the truth of history. And the documentary incorporates many of Wang's photographs from the aftermaths of his wife's murder. And these are clearly the, the personal archive of memory. Indeed, the film works up to a standout moment in which Wang opens what is literally a personal archive of material objects relating to Bian, which is he, he has not touched them for decades. And... I've decided not to show the clip. I, I did once before a talk uh, quite a number of years ago, and even I struggled to talk afterwards, and I've seen it several times. It's just very harrowing. But he's got this suitcase of, the, the you know, the, the material he's kept from the time, and it includes these photographs. <clears throat> so the archive includes blood-stained clothes that Bian was wearing when she was beaten to death, Wang's photographs, uh, the documents of you know him trying to get justice from the authorities, the testimony of other witnesses and survivors, and other artifacts preserved for nearly four decades, and that includes uh, two watches. Now, together, these objects resemble exhibits. I think at trial, they also indicate materially that Wang's personal museum of memory exists in the folds within official history, packed away in a suitcase in his home, the private archive. We might be tempted then, especially on first viewing of this film, to see Though I Am Gone as a straightforward story of justice denied, a personal memory against state history. And this would be as per the current academic consensus on this documentary, and it would be also as per my own findings more broadly about such films from around the world. However, and this is why this film has been really helpful for making me think past my own conclusion, Whilst it focuses on individual memory and the personal archive as a bulwark against Orwellian state denial, things are more historically complex than this, and this influences how we understand what is unknown in the cinematic encounter. Wang and his wife had been, the documentary reveals, loyal party members through the Sino-Japanese War and the Civil War, 
before they then attain the roles they had when the Cultural Revolution erupted. So this is why this is a very interesting example, because in most of the ones we're talking about, you you start to learn something about the opposition that was that was eradicated, the past that has been disappeared by state history, state action, state of exception. Um, whereas in this instance, the people who have who have suffered during the state of exception were part of the official story of history until that point. So it's why it's quite complex now. So Wang and his wife had been, as I say, party members from the Sino-Japanese War, the Civil War, and then the, when they got the roles they had when the, the Cultural Revolution erupted. So Wang's familial history and the majority of the photographs are of the family unit, demonstrate that his grievance may be as much about Bian's murder as it is the injustice and betrayal of the history of the party and the national history constructed by it that they were an integral part of. And this is something they've been working for for many years as, as revolutionaries. So what this means in terms of how we might believe in this world as per Deleuzean cinematic ethics is very interesting. During the film's emotive last minutes, when Wang opens the suitcase of Bian's personal effects, he removes a wristwatch. His hands stopped, we are led to infer, during Bian's violent beating in 1966. Almost immediately afterwards, an old-fashioned fob watch is produced from the suitcase, a different watch which Bian inherited from her stepmother. Now, this watch, the fob watch, Wang informs us, was used in 1947 during the Civil War by the Xinhua News Agency and the Shanbei radio station. This was then based in the Taihan Mountain region after the communist withdrawal from Yainan. So this fob watch enabled the time to be announced to the communist troops over the radio. In the same climactic section of the film, Wang shows us the camera. Sh sorry, Wang shows to the camera Bian's Battlefield Service Group badge. Wang also, when prompted by the director Hu, notes Bian's love of certain songs popular from the Sino-Japanese War, such as Ode to the Yellow River and On the Taihan Mountain. And as he then recounts how Bian sang the latter song in 1945 in the Taihan Mountain region, the music is heard on the soundtrack. So the interpretation of this scene seems fairly clear. But the film is trying to tell us, I think, the violence unleashed by the Cultural Revolution against such loyal party members stopped the clock, if you like, stopped the clock uh, on the history of their service to the party, delegitimizing their personal narrative of political history. So these watches that, you know, that the sort of the, the time, the, the measures of their time as loyal party members, if you like, really integral to the revolution and the, and the Sino-Japanese war, they're all packed away now in, the, in only in the private archive will that sort of service be remembered. So this sort of delegitimizing of their personal narrative of political history is as we would find in a historian of the Cultural Revolution like Paul J. Bailey. He understands the Cultural Revolution in this way. Uh, I flag that because different historians see the Cultural Revolution in quite different ways. The history which was attacked during the Cultural Revolution, now memorialized only in the private lives of family members of deceased victims, and you could say, well, yes, but also banned films like this one, was that of another possible road or roads for the revolution that stemmed from the Yainan period. Okay, so there's obviously there's more to this in the, in the, the, the book chapter, but for our focus today, there are several interlinked unanswered questions which we are then left with after watching the film. What experiences in the biographical past of a loyal party member led Wang to purchase the camera the day after his wife's death? Why did he record her corpse as one would record a body in a crime scene? How did, his, did, how did his experience of political history prior to the Cultural Revolution inform his decision making? And through such questioning, the nature of the injustice which Wang feels is here rendered more complex because he is so integral to the context. What the documentary illustrates is how entwined the personal and the public, the private and the political really are. And this is true both in the historical moment and in the recording of history. At the opening of the film, Wang's photographs of his happy, smiling family are suddenly juxtaposed by the insertion of a picture of four men apparently about to be executed by communist forces. So I'm trying to answer some of these questions or just allude to answers, really. We see this image, again, the one that I've shown you before of the family, and then the montage gives us this one directly. Wang took this in the countryside whilst participating in the four cleanups movement after his graduation from the Central Party School. So one when the when the documentary shows you these, you, you're back with these questions again. You know, does Wang's involvement in such cleanups explain why he 
bought the camera, perhaps? Was he involved in similar beatings or even executions as what happened to his wife? Or did, or did he witness them? Maybe, I don't know. And it's just really hard to tell from the film itself. Or perhaps it's just very hard for someone like me to tell from the film itself. But we are talking about the encounter with the world of cinemas, and that includes my encounter as well as everyone else's. Perhaps all we can say is that Wang knew enough from experience to create an archive with which to seek justice in a time yet to come, a time during which its images would contrast with the propaganda-like images of the time, images then which would later challenge, reimagine, or even, we might say, re-aestheticize the past. So here we see something of the complexities around what is known and unknown about even a lost past, and it is this complexity which sets Though I Am Gone apart from the other documentaries. So here to return to Elizabeth Jelin, we find that the various individual experiences of the past create multiple social and political viewpoints. It isn't just a, a personal archive against the official state memory. It's just not that simple. Not private memory against public silence, rather memory against memory. I think I've still got three or four minutes left, so I, I might just, uh, just manage to finish. <clears throat> Memory against memory may explain how, in a world of cinemas, the intertwined nature of the private past with the official story of the public past may determine what can be known and what is perhaps unknowable about such a lost past. How can we really, what, how much, how much can we really grasp of this history? Well, it depends to a great extent on what the film chooses to reveal to the viewer and how it frames it. But we also have to acknowledge that what the viewer may already know is also key. And I'll just say what I mean by that. For those more familiar with the historical incident, including audiences in China, I think, uh, much in Though I Am Gone was not, may not seem to need to be stated explicitly, even if for a viewer like myself, it would need to be. For example, the documentary includes footage of a famous scene at the Tiananmen Square rally in which a young red guard, Song Bin Bin, puts a red, arm, red guard armband on Chairman Mao. And he, famously, inquired after her name. And then when he heard it, he remarked that it would have been better were it. And then he pronounces it slightly differently in a way which would mean want arms, or sometimes that's translated as be violent. And this was interpreted by many as a legitimizing court of violence, which repelled the murderous excesses which would follow of the Cultural Revolution. Now, in the documentary, this is presented to the uninitiated, like myself, as contextualizing evidence of Mao's role in inciting the violence. But for those with more knowledge of the events themselves, there's something else really apparent. But if you don't know a bit more about it, it just isn't apparent at all. There is a much more direct link evident to the particular story of Wang and the murdered Bian. And it's more, this scene in the documentary is more than just context. At the center of the controversy surrounding who killed Bian is Song Bin Bin. Now she was a leading red guard at the girls' school. So the incident with the armband occurred 12 days after the death of Bian. And the two events became linked by the presence of Song and the increased violence which soon followed. So the insertion of this footage may be intended, for viewers aware of this more granular level of Chinese history, which I was not, to imply that the Cultural Revolution cleared a path for the social advancement of the elite's children at the expense of loyal party members. And this view of the Cultural Revolution is posited, or at least, you know, discussed by historians like Lin T. White III. But amidst the vast maelstrom of films from the world of cinemas and all the world's myriad histories and their political inflections, how many potential viewers would know of this specific controversy, whether viewers elsewhere like me or perhaps even for many in China itself? So I'm going to round off now. Perhaps I'll go a minute over time, perhaps if you'll allow me. The very specific depiction of Song Bin Bin indicates that, depending on the viewer, the documentary may be all that we can know of this history, and even that can be only patchily understood without more in-depth research. But what the encounter with Though I Am Gone reveals can only really be the ability of cinema to indicate, even if tacitly, its inability to fully represent the world and its histories. So this is my big conclusion. I'd like to just unpack it for another minute or two, if that's allowed. What do we think, uh, Ditch? Yeah, I, I guess we are running out of time, but uh, you can have still a few minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. I'll just unpack this, but maybe two more minutes. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so at best, this indicates the ability that this gives the viewer to realize their inability, their inability. Okay, at best, this indicates the ability that viewing a world of cinemas gives to the viewer to realize their inability to fully know history or rather histories.
So this conclusion places us somewhere between my ideas in Cinema Against Doublethink, which was published in 2018, and the critique of it by Stone and Friechel. Though I am gone does keep alive an alternative lost past and cause hesitation over the centrality of the official story of history. So it's kind of like Cinema Against Doublethink and those other documentaries about the Cold War. It's also a bit akin to a Deleuze in cinematic ethics, or at least one inflected through Decel, as I've suggested in the book. Though I Am Gone does have the power to shake a viewer like myself out of a, any too Eurocentric sense of history by indicating a lost past which is preserved in world memory, which I, I don't really know about. But there is more to it than this. The intertwined nature of Wang and Bian's lives with the Communist Party in the decades prior to the Cultural Revolution render this less a personal memory against official history and more memory against memory. Specifically here, a conflict over how the official story of the revolution is remembered prompted by those it left behind from the party's own ranks. Even so, and despite this difference from my previous conclusions in Cinema Against Doublethink, it does not take us as far as Stone and Friejo. Analysis of this film does not point towards the ability of world cinemas, as they've argued of genre films, to help us realise the as yet unknown through an encounter with alterity. And I think what I'm really pointing out is it kind of depends on the types of films that we're looking at. The initial impression left by Though I Am Gone of its encouraging of an ethical re-engagement with the world via the recovery of a tragic familial past ultimately appears to reflect more upon the difficulties of realising the complexities of the many lost or censored world histories which re-emerge in time images. Still a reason to believe in this world, perhaps, but with great nuance around its complex histories. We may find belief, as Deleuze argued, but a lot remains unknown. The realisation of that may indeed cause us the hesitation that I've been talking about. This distinction is crucial because if the re-emergence of a submerged history is the ethical potential of such cinemas, then the way in which the story of a submerged history is told and understood, the politics of this history, effectively, would directly influence its ethical potential to rejuvenate or not a belief in this world. So I'm really getting at the fact that the idea of an ethics like that depends an awful lot on the politics of how the story is framed. Then it depends on the viewer as well. An encounter with Though I Am Gone may challenge our ability to know what precisely to believe in in this world. For the ethical life of Wang, this revolves around a sense of justice, but with a particular political inflection revealing of the competed or contested nature of history itself, memory against memory again. So a world of histories may archive world memory, but it seemingly cannot present world history. It does not have that ability. It cannot show what is known but it does have the ability to prompt the viewer to the insight of what they are unable to know about world history. And there's a little bit more here, but I think I'll just, I'll just close it off there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Martin Jones. That was a great speech and an inspiring one. Uh, I will ask the audience if they have any questions right now.